and thank you for joining us today for Assessing Need to Inform Patient-Centered Program Development. My name is Elizabeth Reed, and I'm the Project Manager of Healthcare Professional Education at the GW Cancer Institute. We have over 90 individuals on the webinar today, and we are excited to have you. Before we get started, I would like to take a few minutes to go over housekeeping remarks. We ask everyone to keep their phones on mute to avoid any background noise and disruption during the program. Due to the large audience size, we will utilize the Q&A feature for this webinar. You will see the Q&A box at the bottom right hand of your screen. If at any time during the presentation you have a question, please type it in and we will address it during the Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. The questions are anonymous and I will repeat the question and direct it to our presenters. We will take questions at the end of the presentation, but feel free to write questions in the Q&A box as we go and we will make sure to answer them during the time allotted. To reduce the background noise and enhance communication quality, we will utilize this feature for all questions during the webinar. I would like to take a moment to review today's agenda. I will provide an overview of the Center for the Advancement of Cancer Survivorship Navigation and Policy, followed by Ann Willis from the GW Cancer Institute presenting on Identifying Need, and Ashley Nelson from the Brown Cancer Center presenting on their April 2012 need, Needs Assessment for Patient Navigation. We will wrap up the webinar with some Q&A from the participants. Reminder that due to the large audience size today, we will take Q&A through the Q&A feature on your screen. Survivorship Navigation and Policy, which we affectionately call CA SNAP, was created in 2009 through a generous grant from the Pfizer Global Health Partnerships Program. The mission of the center is to advance cancer survivorship and patient navigation efforts locally and nationally through training, research, policy analysis, outreach, and education. The center offers survivorship and navigation resources that are available online at our website and through a monthly e-newsletter. Additional material is sent through the CASNAP listserv to over 2,000 subscribers. CASNAP staff write white papers, create case studies, and work cooperatively with other healthcare organizations to advance patient-centered care. We have policy papers on our website to educate patients and the public about the impact of the Affordable Care Act on cancer patients and families. We also share summaries of meetings and roundtables we have hosted to catalyze patient navigation, cancer survivorship, and patient-centered care initiatives. CSNAP is best known for its signature training. The Executive Training on Navigation and Survivorship, Finding Your Patient Focus is a two-day training program that equips healthcare professionals with the tools needed to launch and sustain navigation and survivorship programs, two cornerstones of patient-centered care. Participants learn strategic planning techniques for developing, implementing, evaluating, and sustaining patient navigation and survivorship programs. Since 2010, we have trained over 250 healthcare professionals from 34 states, Canada, Puerto Rico, and the Marshall and Mariana Islands. We recently hosted our executive training September 26th and 27th in Washington, D.C., in which 34 individuals participated. GWCI was recently awarded $2.1 million in funding from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to provide technical assistance and support to comprehensive cancer control programs. We will be leveraging CA SNAP's online academy to carry out activities over the five-year grant period, so please look for more online offerings shortly. Today's webinar is a part of the CA SNAP monthly webinar series launched in April 2013. Since its development, over 1,200 individuals have participated in the series, and we are excited to bring to you a webinar on assessing needs to inform patient-centered program development. I would like to now introduce our speakers today. A long-term Ewing sarcoma survivor, Ann Willis is the director of the Division of Cancer Survivorship at the George Washington University Cancer Institute and director of the GW Center for the Advancement of Cancer Survivorship Navigation and Policy. Anne directs CA SNAP efforts, including education and training programs for healthcare professionals, meetings on navigation and survivorship, and health policy initiatives. Previous to GWCI, Anne was the director of survivorship programs for the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship, where she developed and disseminated evidence-based programs, including the award-winning Cancer Survival Toolbox, to empower patients with cancer to advocate for themselves across the survivorship continuum. Ashley Nelson is the Brown Cancer Center Quality Coordinator at the University of Louisville Hospital in Louisville, Kentucky. Prior to her position at the Brown Cancer Center, she was the donor recruiter for the National Marrow Donor Program at the University of Louisville Hospital. She is a registered nurse, and she has her Bachelor's of Science in Nursing from the University of Louisville. 
I would now like to turn it over to Anne. Great, thanks Liz. Today we're going to talk about needs assessment, so I wanted to give you an overview of the topic to frame Ashley's presentation. The learning objectives of this presentation are to articulate the importance of conducting a needs assessment, identify principles or techniques for conducting a needs assessment, and implement needs assessment tools to identify patient needs, assess organizational capacity, and identify internal and external resources. The term patient-centered is being increasingly used as we talk about improving our healthcare system. So, for example, the Affordable Care Act created the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, which funds research looking specifically at patient-centered outcomes, which are the outcomes that are most relevant and important to patients. Um, the Affordable Care Act also emphasizes value-based care versus volume-based care, which is a clear shift in perspective. The Commission on Cancer, uh, which accredits cancer programs that care for about 70% of the newly diagnosed patients across the country, has developed new patient-centered standards related to patient navigation, survivorship, and psychosocial distress screening. So these standards are being phased in, and they'll take effect in January of 2015. And one of the core components of the navigation standard is a community needs assessment that's conducted at least once for every three-year survey cycle, um, and then presented annually to the Cancer Committee. So with all these new care standards rapidly approaching, a lot of institutions are trying to figure out the most effective way to conduct a needs assessment. So needs assessment really helps you to understand the specific needs of your patient population and your institution's priorities. It helps you identify the gap between current and ideal conditions and to identify barriers and challenges to develop a program that's responsive to the needs of your patients. And I think it's really important to note that assessment is not a one-time process. Continual evaluation is needed to make sure that you're meeting the needs of the patients and the community. And needs change as people and circumstances change. So for example, external forces such as an economic recession may leave people out of work, and then that may leave them uninsured with less access to medical care, which all exacerbate the needs of your patient population. So you actually conduct a needs assessment all the time. Um, for example, Thanksgiving is coming up. We all have our traditions, mashed potatoes versus sweet potatoes versus baked potatoes. As your family expands, it's important to know what everyone's expectations and needs are. So you might like mom's sweet potatoes with marshmallows, your partner might like to have garlic mashed potatoes, and your daughter may like roasted potatoes. And in order for the dinner to be a success, you really need to know beforehand so you can prepare adequately, get the right ingredients and the right amount so that everybody's needs are satisfied, even if that means that you have three kinds of potatoes. So maybe you decide to have more options, but you make a little less of each than you otherwise would have. So program success is correlated to understanding the needs of the population that you're serving. And a needs assessment, again, can help you identify the barriers and challenges that your patients face. If you know the need, then you can better address that need and improve patient satisfaction and hopefully overall quality of life for your patients as well. So these are four components of a needs assessment. Defining your patient population, assessing institutional capacity, identifying resources, gathering key stakeholder data. And so we'll walk through each of those components. It's helpful to start by defining your patient population to get a better sense of who you're trying to serve. For example, do you see a population with a high percentage of Latinos? Do they tend to be older? Do you see mostly lung cancer? Are there things that your patient population in particular struggles with, such as health literacy or transportation? And you may want to look at your cancer registry data to gather some of the information. And you may also want to brainstorm who your patient population is with other people at your institution. And thinking through this information is going to help you with the fourth component in gathering stakeholder data. 
So this slide just shows some potential sources of information to help you identify your patient population. Um, you may have a cancer program registry within your own institution. Um, there, you can access your state cancer registry. Uh, your state cancer plan might have some information about the patients um, in general in your state. The American Cancer Society puts out some facts and figures reports. Uh, the CDC has cancer statistics, and the NCI also has SEER data, and the census data might also be helpful for defining your patient population. And when, when you're defining your patient population challenges, you might also want to create a patient flow diagram or a process map to see how patients move through your institution. It can make it easier to identify points in which patients need the most assistance or where the biggest challenges are. And you can repeat this activity to create your ideal patient flow. It's also important to note that if you're mapping the patient experience, you need to actually map what's really happening, not what should be happening or what you think is happening. So this is just one way to think about a flow diagram. There's no right or wrong way to do it. Uh, and the intent of this image is just to get you thinking about what's happening at various points in the continuum. So, for example, in screening, how or where are patients screened? What happens if there's an abnormal finding? How do they get notified? How do they get to your institution? And then for diagnosis, what happens when patients are diagnosed? How are those treatment decisions made? And what happens um, after treatment options are discussed? For treatment, what happens after treatment begins? What does that look like for the patient? Are psychosocial needs addressed? Are resources available? Which ones? Um, how are medical, psychosocial, and practical needs managed? And who is doing that? And for post-treatment, what happens when treatment ends? Is there communication with the primary care provider? And again, how are the medical, psychosocial, and practical needs managed? And who, are, who is uh, responsible for doing those? So I know that you can't read this slide, but I just wanted to show you another format for presenting the patient experience. Um, so this process map shows where the patient enters the system, what happens at various points, and who's involved at various points. Um, so I really just wanted to show you the image because it's very common to see a process map that uses boxes and arrows to show how, how something progresses um, and how a patient would progress through the system. So after you know your patient needs, you will need to assess your own institutional capacity to determine what services or needs you're best suited to address. So one tool for this is a SWOT analysis. A SWOT analysis identifies your institutional strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats to help set direction and chart the future course for your program. So typically, the strengths and weaknesses refer to those that are internal to your organization, and the opportunities and threats are external to your organization. So to think through strengths and weaknesses internal to your organization, consider who are the staff that are available to use for your program? Do your staff have the time to go through medical records and create a survivorship care plan? Do you have space to hold support groups, clinical visits, or other things? Is there money allocated in your department's budget, or do you have outside funding to support your program? Is there a program champion and support from upper management and other clinical staff? What is the reputation of the institution and the staff involved in your program? So here are some example strengths um, and weaknesses. So for strengths, maybe you have committed oncologists. Um, and maybe you have existing space for your program, so that's not an issue. Um, and maybe you have some grant support that would fund some, uh, some dietitian's time and some educational classes. But on the other hand, um, everybody's really busy, so maybe there's not enough time um, for people to help support this program. And even though the, committed, the oncologists are committed, maybe senior leadership isn't committed, and maybe there needs to be more support. Um, or maybe there's a feeling that, that there's an unfunded mandate from administration that you're required to implement some new program or service, but there's no funding to help you do that. Those are all important things to think about as you're um, conducting a needs assessment. 
So opportunities and threats, again, are the ones that are external to your organization. So some things to consider include, uh, do the new Commission on Cancer Standards influence the direction of your organization? Think about the Affordable Care Act and expansion of insurance coverage and change in Medicare and Medicaid coverage policies. Given expanding Medicaid eligibility, this population will grow significantly. Does that impact your organization? Have you seen changes in your patient population? Are they getting older, more obese, or struggling more financially? Is there a, an issue with billable services for your program? How do you fund your services? Are those services reimbursable? And also consider the economic, political, or societal issues going on in your area that may influence your institution or organization. So again, here are some sample opportunities and threats. Um, so the Commission on Cancer Standards might be seen as a, an opportunity to improve your programs and your, your services. Health reform might also be seen as an opportunity. And if you're interested in starting a survivorship program, maybe uh, your program is the only one in your market, and that's a real opportunity. Um, and then m another opportunity could be that there are a lot of community-based organizations, and your organization has a great relationship with those groups. Some threats might be that the grants that we identified as strengths, maybe those are running out or there's limited funding. Um, maybe there's limited funding in general for adding new staff. And maybe something that's happening within your market is that there's a high unemployment rate, so um, there's limited access to care and increased um, uninsured. So information from your SWOT analysis will be helpful during other steps of the program planning process. The third component of the needs assessment is identification of internal and external resources. Resource or asset mapping is a system building process to align resources and policies in relation to specific goals, strategies, and expected outcomes. It can help to build capacity of organizations to better serve those affected by cancer. And resource or asset mapping complements the SWOT analysis by further identifying resources that may help to overcome your weaknesses and threats and build a sustainable program. Identifying resources is important because it can help identify new resources that you didn't know existed. It can increase access to resources by making you aware of their existence. Um, it can help identify resource or existing services so you can determine areas that you don't need to create a new resource for because one already exists. It can foster new relationships within your institution and your community, which can help with program implementation. Uh, Resource mapping can decrease fragmentation by sharing information so everybody's all on the same page. And it can encourage collaboration and partnerships, which are increasingly important in our current economic situation, and can help improve programs and services. So there's two types of resources, those that are internal to your organization and those that are external to your organization. So those might be in the community or at the state or national levels. And we'll go into each of these a little bit. The example, examples of internal resources include program champions, administrative staff, um, other supportive care staff. There's departments. Um, there might be some physical or space, spatial resources, and then financial resources. So the program champions are the ones that are really excited about your program and can help um, to promote your program or your resource. So maybe it's the head of hematology oncology, or maybe it's a nurse practitioner, or maybe it's somebody in administration. Um, for administrative resources, maybe the, the scheduler or the biller or the registrar are important resources to know about. Um, in particular, the registrar, again, we've talked about, might be able to help with um, some of your needs assessment data collection. Uh, clinical staff, maybe you have a nurse practitioner, maybe you have an oncologist, maybe there's a dietitian. Um, maybe you also have a patient advocate and support groups and educational classes and a physical therapist in your institution. Um, maybe some of the departments that might be helpful are marketing and IT. And then for physical space, um, maybe you have some clinic space or some office space that you could leverage for your program. 
So external resources include individuals, they include national organizations, local institutions, physical resources, fiscal resources, and state offices. And in terms of the Commission on Cancer Patient Navigation Standard, it's really important to remember that it's not required that you have all of these services at your institution. Um, they just need to be available either in-house or by referral. So individuals might be volunteer cancer survivors, local organizations here in D.C., for example, we have our D.C. Cancer Consortium, um, Smith Center for Healing and the Arts is a community organization, um, Food and Friends, Bread for the City, or just other um, non-cancer specific organizations that might be helpful. National organizations include the American Cancer Society, Livestrong, the CDC, Cancer Care, so a long list of great um, national organizations. A physical resource could include maybe your local library or your local recreation center, or maybe even a senior center, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, financial resources, maybe there's the Avon Foundation or Susan G. Komen, um, or maybe there's a physician foundation. And then, um, again, the state offices might also be able to help. To inform your program development, you may also need to do a formal stakeholder needs assessment that includes multiple stakeholders to better understand different perspectives. A needs assessment for any of these stakeholders can be done through focus groups, formal or informal interviews, surveys, or data mining. And one of the most obvious stakeholder groups that we tend to think of first is patients or survivors and or caregivers. Um, and although you may want to do a separate caregiver assessment depending on, what, on your program goals, the assessments can be very similar for those groups. Um, so you could do this through a patient survey, you could uh, talk with your cancer registrar, or you might want to look at local community data that's available or your state comprehensive cancer control program. And sometimes when we talk about getting feedback from patients, it seems a little overwhelming. And you don't necessarily need to interview 100 patients. A focus group with six to eight patients might work just fine. Or maybe the data you actually, maybe the data you need actually already exists in a patient satisfaction survey or in some other form. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a huge, expensive undertaking. And when developing a program, it's important to also take into account the views and opinions of physicians, other providers, and staff. This audience can also identify additional patient needs or services that can be of value. Um, but understanding their perspective and how they might approach solving problems not only helps with your program design, but it can also help create buy-in, which is one of the big barriers that program creators face. So you could ask questions like, how would you rate how well the institution addresses post-treatment needs of cancer survivors? Or are there particular types of patients you believe are most in need of patient navigation services? And you may also want to seek additional information from community organizations that also serve your patients. Um, you can ask about which needs they think most need to be addressed, what services they provide, and how you can collaborate to best utilize resources. So that was a quick big picture overview of four components of a needs assessment. And here are some tips to think about um, what might work in your institution and community. So talk to your registrar to see what data you're already collecting. It could be that the information you need already exists. Try to add existing, try to add to an existing patient survey instead of having to create a new survey if that's possible. Look into your state comprehensive cancer profile for data. Again, this data is easy to access and it may be helpful. And finally, work with community-based organizations to identify the needs of your population. They may already have data or they may have a useful perspective for thinking about patients. And as we know, there are a great deal of health disparities in cancer care. It can be overwhelming to try to address them all at once. It can be better to start small, tackle one or a few at a time, and then expand rather than try to solve all of them at once. For example, you might want to start with a specific disease type like breast cancer, or you may want to start with a focus on one phase of the continuum if you don't have the staff or time to cover the full spectrum of services across the cancer continuum. So that's the end of my presentation, and I'm excited to hand it over to Ashley to walk us through a case study of a needs assessment for a patient navigation program. 
Hi, um, this is Ashley Nelson. Thank you, uh, Ann. That was wonderful. I'm very happy to be here today. And again, I am the Brown Cancer Center Quality Coordinator for the James Graham Brown Cancer Center in Louisville, Kentucky. We are a part of Kentucky One Health. And I am here to discuss a community needs assessment that was performed under the direction of the Cancer Committee in late 2011 and early 2012. This was actually um, um, not, we weren't thinking in terms of the ACA, um, et cetera. This was the Cancer Committee based. So first, a little bit about um, the organization at that time, kind of a snapshot of the organization 2011-2012. 404 bed nonprofit profit academic medical center, and we are the teaching campus for the University of Louisville Medical School, nursing school. Um, um, we're located adjacent to the hospital, the outpatient cancer center is, and of course there are values for 2012. Um, let's go ahead. And um, again, since we've um, had a change in organizational structure and have joined with Kentucky One Health, uh, when we do our next community needs assessment, we will be taking into account um, our new organizational structure, um, our new organizational values, mission, uh, and vision. So again, this is a, s a retrospective snapshot. Um, so when we started this process, um, the first thing it was kind of interesting because I wanted to do it, and I'm a nurse, and I, you know, <laughs> I wasn't really sure what I was doing. And so, what I wanted to start with first was to take a look at um, who are our patients that are actually coming through our door. So, I did go to the registry, which is a wonderful source of data, um, and found that our patients were coming from Jefferson County, which is, you know, where our organization is and the contiguous counties um, just outside of ours. Um, looked at, again, I just went on the internet, and it's amazing the information you can find on the internet, and I'll go into that a little bit more. But the median household incomes ranged in those counties, you know, from 41 to 78, so there's a, some variation there. Um, some variation with regard to the degree of education uh, and the percentage of pop, uh, patients who said they had a personal doctor, um, as well as the percentage of patients who said they had foregone care due to the cost. Um, and again, since we weren't really looking at this in terms of the ACA, we wanted to specifically kind of hone in on disparities and barriers, barriers related to uh, cancer care. Um, so we initiated this process, of course. Um, we considered it to be a, a dry run um, for the new uh, 2015 patient-centered uh, standards. And I wanted to do this, and my um, boss said, go for it. <laughs> so um, I just, just asked the cancer committee if that would be okay, and they were in agreement, so I went for it. Um, so I went to the cancer registry first, and then just started looking around on the internet for what, you know, what data I could find. And it was amazing to me. There are lots of interactive um, websites, Centers for Disease Control, uh, NCI, um, Kentucky Department of Health, and the U.S. Census Bureau, where you can get on there and hone in on your county and find out so much information. Um, and, and Quite frankly, it was so much information that it's easy to get analysis paralysis, and uh, it was just a lot of data. And so um, I had to kind of work with my boss, and you know, she kept saying, "You're not an epidemiologist, you know. Just let's just look at the major variables, kind of what what uh, Anne was talking about, you know, one one bite at a time. This elephant, you know, let's let's look at the." the the big things. So we decided to paint with broad strokes, and um, we didn't, decided we didn't need to understand every single nuance of the community. Uh, we just limited it to the, the major variables. Um, and basically, we decided the Cancer Committee, we felt like when we looked at this data, what I did was I just put the data into tables and just presented it at the Cancer Committee. 
and then with, I presented it without comment and just kind of let people, you know, take a look at it and see what they thought. And um, some things really leapt off the page. Our lung cancer burden is just tremendous. Um, we have a very high youth smoking rate, very high smoking rates in general. Uh, we had a disproportionate uh, high-risk behavior, binge drinking, nutrient-poor diets, uh, low income, low education levels. And some of these things, you know, you would think, wow, you know, these, this is obvious. If you've looked at any data about Kentucky, you would know this. But, you know, as Anne mentioned, it's important to get actual data and manage by fact rather than by anecdotal evidence. And that's what, you know, we wanted to do that. And so um, I'm going to kind of. So when we decided to talk about our navigation, we, we decided to think about our navigation as a fluid and evolving process. And that's kind of what Ann was talking about related to this is not a one-time thing. You don't just take a, you know, one look at, the, at your community and say, okay, this is it. But it's, it's a fluid and evolving process. And it involves the entire continuum of care, all the way from screening and community education, um, to diagnosis, treatment, and then on to survivorship. Um, and when we looked at our process, we felt like we had a very robust um, beginning of our process. We, you know, we have a very strong relationship and work, we work very closely with the Kentucky Cancer Program. And um, they are wonderful helping us increase awareness of cancer prevention and risk factors with cancer screenings, early detection, uh, incorporating evidence-based findings into treatment and resources, and improving quality of life for cancer survivors. So we had this wonderful relationship with the Kentucky Cancer Program in place for you know, over a decade already, over two decades. Um, and then we've also had um, a very robust nurse navigation process. Um, We've had it in place for over a decade, and we embraced this kind of multidisciplinary uh, clinic concept uh, before it became popular. And the major disciplines involved in it are radiology, pathology, surgery, radiation oncology, medical oncology, nurse navigators, social workers, uh, dietitian, patient navigators, speech therapists, geneticists, psychiatrists, psychologists clinical trials, um, and additional nursing staff for each um, discipline. So we had a lot of clinical knowledge and research-based expertise. We felt like we were, not that there's not room for improvement. There is always room for improvement. But we, felt, we felt like that was pretty strong part of our program. And at the same time that we were developing, uh, we were looking at these phase and standards, we formed a subcommittee of our cancer committee to work on survivorship. So there was a separate group who was already um, kind of split off and working on survivorship. And we did recognize that that was a uh, huge gap in our services. So we felt like we were kind of already working on that, and we wanted to um, look at our lung cancer burden because it just it just was astounding. Um, and keep in mind, this was in March, April 2012. And so at that time, um, there was very little scientific support for low-dose lung screening. Um, it was at that time we were working with the results from the NCI National Lung uh, Cancer Screening Trial, which had been published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, in 2011. Um, and one of the things, you know, with lung cancer is we've seen the incidence go down over time, but mortality has not really changed. It's, it's really, you know, horrible. Um, less than 20% five-year survival rate. So we're seeing the incidence go down, but the patients who do get lung cancer, their, their mortality is very, very low, high rather. And uh, so we wanted to look at the results of the National Lung Cancer Screening Trial and see. And what that trial did was to compare, um, 
They randomized half the candidates to X-ray versus uh, low-dose lung CT screening, and um, they evaluated high-risk patients, and um, they successfully demonstrated that the low-dose CT screening decreased mortality by 20%. So we felt like that was really important. Um, we didn't have, you know, at that time we we didn't have the professional organizations endorsing low-dose lung CT screening as they have subsequently done. Um, so, but we felt like, gosh, we've got to do something with this. And then another thing we were noticing is that, um, of course, you know, and this is in the literature, that most early stage um, lung cancers are discovered incidentally. Uh, so through some other medical problem, um, a, a nodule is found and, and, you know, it's an early diagnosis of lung cancer. And so we realized that, you know, we were having a, patients come through our ER who were having these incidental findings. Um, they may have come in for something completely different, but on chest x-ray there's a suspicious finding. And so we wanted to develop a relationship between the ED physicians and our interventional pulmonologists and our lung team so that we could follow up with those patients. Uh, we didn't want them to fall through the cracks. And so we kind of developed this model, uh, pulmonary nodule model clinic. And what we did with that was, um, at first, it was you know, just creating these working relationships. And um, and that was that was I will say I, you know I was not involved in in that working group and it was you know bringing together a lot of different people to work together uh, as a team and you know that's going to become more and more important with the ACA that coordination of care and communication among care providers and you know it's a challenge. Um, silos within organizations and between organizations. So this was this was a challenge and it and it was it was overcome and we we I can't take any credit for it. I do have to give credit to the team involved. Um, another challenge that we've seen, um, we also to start once um, various organizations, the American Cancer Society, um, NCCN, the Lung Cancer Alliance, American Lung Association um, started to endorse low-dose lung CT screening um, almost immediately after we performed this needs assessment. We started to offer um, low-dose lung CT screening um, to the public, and uh, we were able to create a business case that, you know, it was, um, even though it's not covered by insurance and we were, you know, offering it at a very discounted rate, we were going to um, get these patients in earlier. They would have a better quality of life if they were, you know, diagnosed earlier. Um, and it would be a lot less cost, a lot less burden on the system, a lot less uh, burden on the patient, the family, everyone involved if we could uh, diagnose earlier. Um, lessons that we've learned. Um, Population-based health planning is where we are headed. I mean, I think everyone who reads um, articles about the ACA and, you know, where we're headed in terms of reimbursement, um, this is where we're headed. And so it's necessary, again, and I think it's really important to manage by fact and not just by anecdotal evidence. And the way you do that is by actually looking at your data. Um, we did learn that, of course, lung dose, low dose lung CT screening requires a lot of continuity of care. Um, if a patient does have a suspicious finding, we don't want that patient to fall through the cracks. We need to get them back to their PCP and continue follow up and monitoring of that patient. So again, um, what Anne was talking about, you know, looking at your, you know, working with um, other care providers outside of your institution. This is kind of going to be more and more where we're headed, and it's it can be a struggle. And we are, we are learning that, you know, we've got to have better communication with uh, primary care physicians. Um, we learned that lung cancer can be detected uh, earlier. We learned it here 
uh, with our, our own patients, and we were able to treat at earlier stages for better quality of life. And another thing that we learned um, is that insurance coverage is really needed for this. Um, even though we're offering it at a reduced cost uh, because insurance does not cover it, um, some patients can't afford it. Uh, we've been seeking funding for those patients, um, and we hope to find funding for that. Um, programming program successes. I'm going to show you some data in a, in a minute, but um, again, uh, we've kind of alluded to some of this. But um, as we moved, you know, from early 2000, late 2011 to 2012, into later into 2012, there are more and more endorsements um, for low dose lung CT screening uh, from uh, lung cancer. Uh, advocacy groups, and so that really helped um, to get the word out that there are benefits um, to low-dose lung CT screening, whereas before it kind of was like chest x-ray was the standard. So I just wanted to um, show you um, the 2012 results. Before the NCCN issued their um, guidelines for low-dose lung CT screening, we used Fleischner Society's recommendations. And um, so here is, is what we, we had. So um, of the patients that we screened, 72% of them required additional medical follow-up and or care. 28% um, of them had no nodule. But 72% of our patients that we screened um, needed additional medical follow-up and or care. 21% of our patients had um, smaller than 4 millimeter nodules. 15% of them had 4 to 6 millimeter. 3% had 6 to 8 millimeter. 6% 6 had great, greater than 8 millimeter nodules. And then we had some other... Um, Multiple nodules, 13%, scarring, 3%. And these are high-risk patients who will need follow-up scans for, per the uh, Fleischner Society's pulmonary guidelines. So we felt really good that we had demonstrated um, that 9% you know, nine, 9 of those uh, findings were malignancies. So that was significant. Additional findings. Um, we found granulomas uh, in 28% of patients. We had uh, found cardiac calcifications in 36%, interstitial lung disease in 5%, and we even found a triple A uh, in 3% of our patients who we screened. So we felt like this was a really um, important screening tool. We still do, and we, we really are, are working now for um, trying to get um, insurance, third-party payers to cover it now that we have all these endorsements. So I thank you very much for your time, and there's my contact information. Informative presentation about the needs assessment carried out at the Brown Cancer Center. We've come to the conclusion of the presentation, and I would like to open it up for questions. If you have any questions, please write them in in the Q&A box on your screen, and we will address the questions in the order that they come, and we will take questions until the end of the time allotted for the webinar. Um, so one of the things I do want to mention is that um, the slides will be sent out after today's webinar, and we will also send out the recording to the webinar as well. Um, so, and uh, we have a few questions. Um, do you, one of the questions is, do you have any templates to capture um, the needs assessment components that um, Anne, you mentioned today? Yeah, so if you are interested, um, we do have some activities that can help you guide through collecting that information. So if you are interested in those, um, please email us at casnp at gwu.edu. Um, and that email address is also in the chat box. Thank you. And Ashley, um, are you able to expand a little bit on um, the way in which you presented the data to the cancer committee um, and, and some of their, um, their thoughts or reactions? Or did you go back to any of the data and revise or, and kind of what your final product was? Well, um, 
What I did was just put, um, I'm, I'm looking at it right now, it's been a, <laughs> been a year. What I did was to look at um, the U.S. incidents for the top 10 cancer sites for the most recent five years available, uh, male and female, all races. And then I compared that and mortality, so incidents and mortality for the top 10 cancer sites, male and female, um, all races for the, the previous five years available. And then we compared that to Kentucky's incidence and mortality. And I'm just looking at this. So um, the U.S. incidence, for example, of lung and bronchus cancer was 68.1. And ours was, um, oh my gosh, I'm missing a page. And so they toss into, I'm missing a page. I apologize. That was a bad example. <laughs> um, but our, our mortality, when I presented this data, it was just like, whoa, Kentucky has unbelievable um, mortality from lung cancer. I did an age-adjusted invasive cancer incidence rate by Kentucky County, and I did, I did that by, um, again, our county and then the contiguous counties, which is from our registry data. I could tell that's where our patients were coming from. So we looked at that, and it was just put into tables. And again, I, I put all this into tables and presented it without comment. Um, then I presented the top five analytic cases that we've seen uh, by cancer site uh, at the cancer center. And then I took select demographics from um, Jefferson County and our contiguous counties. And things like, um, I mentioned a few of them, but medium household income, lack of physical activity, prevalence of obesity, recommended fruit and vegetable intake, prevalence of smoking. Um, youth smoking, binge drinking, and we looked at those uninsured um, population, and I just put, I just put them into tables, and so when again it was almost like instantaneous that the physicians and people on the committee were like, wow, I'm just this is just leaping off the page this lung cancer burden, and so we just had a discussion then, and then I typed up what our discussion had been about and brought that back um, to the committee. And that was where we decided what we were going to focus on in terms of that year. And again, like Ann said, you can't possibly drain the ocean. Um, there are so many needs and disparities out there. And so you just have to start somewhere. And um, we just we felt like our lung cancer burden was something we really needed to address first. And so um, that's where we started. We started focusing on our pulmonary nodule clinic and promoting the benefits of low-dose lung CT screening out in the community. I don't know if that answered the question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also a question about um, where you got the data regarding foregoing care due to cost. That was, let me look at my, I think it was off of the census. Hold on. I believe it was. That was from KentuckyHealthFacts.org. So um, if you go on, if you go on the internet and you start looking, you will not believe how much data is out there. It's overwhelming, um, and that's and that's what I meant by analysis paralysis. Is it was just like, oh my goodness, where do you even start? And so. Just go on your state's um, healthfacts.org, and you, usually what you can do is there are interactive sites. You can plug in what variables you want to look at, and it will spit the data out. And I just, just imagining trying to do this before the internet would have been it would have been a very onerous task, but it's not anymore. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um. So. This is a question for both Ashley and Anne. Um, do you have any advice to those who are new to conducting a needs assessment that you'd like to share? So this is Anne. I'll start. Um, I think the biggest piece of advice is to really 
start small and do what you are able to do. So I, I wouldn't try to plan this, you know, multi-phase, million-dollar needs assessment if that's not really feasible. So really um, try to, to narrow it down. And when you're actually conducting the needs assessment, um, and I think Ashley kind of made this point before, really narrow down what information you're collecting. Um, there's lots of data that you could collect, but that doesn't mean that you need to collect it. So when you're thinking about um, the first part of defining your patient population, and then when you start thinking about um, doing a stakeholder needs assessment, really be specific and really think through that part to make sure that the data that you're collecting um, will help you for whatever you're planning to use it for. Um, this is Ashley. That was that was great. I, I would just say, you know, again, if you have a registry at your institution, that's where I would recommend that you start. That's how you figure out what. That's how you define your community. Who's you know who's who's coming through your doors. You know what counties do you are you well, going to want to look at? Because as you saw in the presentation that I gave, there's quite a bit of variability. Uh, in the counties where our patients are coming from, just like there's a lot of variability in our patients. So you want to kind of have an idea of who are our patients, and then looking at this other data that you can get off the Internet, these demographic um, variables, you can, you can start to look at, again, but with broad strokes, as Ann just said, you're not an epidemiologist, probably. I know I wasn't. Um, and so I just painted with really broad strokes. Thank you. Um, so we, I don't believe we have any more questions. So I just want to show you, point you to some uh, needs assessment resources. So these resources may be helpful if you're interested in learning more about, the, about needs assessment. Um, there is a great article called Needs Assessment for Cancer Patients and Their Families. Um, and then we also have the Community Toolbox, uh, the Blueprint for Change, um, Cancer Care Patient Navigation, a Call to Action um, from the ACCC, um, and the ACHI Community Health Assessment Toolkit is another resource. Um, and the Commission on Cancer also has a Best Practices repository as well where there are some tools and templates up on their site. And again, we'll send you um, a PDF of the slides so you have all this information as well. So with that, um, I just want to mention that we recently launched our new website that includes information on GWCI, CA SNAP, and the programs and initiatives that were discussed on today's webinar. Um, we ch please check out our free CME e-learning series uh, for primary care providers at www.cancersurvivorshipcentereducation.org. And please save the date for November 20th um, at noon Eastern for healthcare professionals' attitudes towards social media usage survey results webinar. We hope that you will join us again, and following this webinar, you will receive an email with the recording evaluation survey to provide feedback on today's webinar, as well as today's slides. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope you have a great day, and you may disconnect at this time. <laughs>